So, good evening, the future. Wonderful to be here. I was actually scheduled to be at a high-level event down at the UN headquarters, but when Sam called and um, I had this opportunity to have this exchange with, with you, I canceled immediately to come over. And uh, I just want to start by congratulating SDSN youth. It is absolutely extraordinary what youth can accomplish in advancing the agenda on the Sustainable Development Goals. And you may take it for granted, this integration between knowledge, science, solutions, and arts, but it certainly isn't. And it's absolutely clear, though, that touching both the brain and the heart, the rational and the emotional, is the only pathway to really reconnect human development to a stable and resilient planet. But I won't be dwelling on that. What I'd like to do with you is actually um, share with you just some very personal testimonies on what we're facing. And the way to start that is, is just a little reminder that it's the one year anniversary of the Sustainable Development Goals. It all happened one year ago. You were probably many of you here. And uh, it is worth just reminding ourselves that this was not only an extraordinary achievement, it is the most important step taken ever, you know, as long as humanity has been on this planet, on defining a desired route and outcome for the entire world population, a universal agenda within a stable and resilient, safe planet. We've never had that before. The Millennium Development Goals were important, they were good, but they totally omitted sustainability. They didn't care about the planet. It was only focused on us humans. Here, for the first time, we now have an agenda which tells us very clearly that we're going to reach very aspirational goals, eradicating hunger, eradicating poverty, having good equity, good gender balance, good education, good lives, good economic development for every citizen on this planet within planetary boundaries. In fact, it's so good that between us, very confidentially, I'm not even sure the heads of state down the streets here really understood what they signed. I think they were actually carried away slightly because one year down the line, we don't see much action. And we certainly don't see efforts that match the promise because the promise is really extraordinary. For the first time, we have heads of state in 196 nations that recognize that we're now facing potentially disastrous risks if we continue unsustainable development and that the only pathway to truly deliver good prosperity for all of us is through a sustainable development path. And that this applies not only for climate change, but it applies for the oceans, it applies for biodiversity, and it applies for fresh water. And this is so extraordinary and such an achievement that many of us were in Central Park dancing to Beyonce the night after we signed because it was a real step change. It was a tipping point for the world. So I think that is something to remember, that what happened in 2015 I can assure you that in 15 years' time, we'll be looking back at what happened in 2015 as the both, potentially the most extraordinary achievement that the United Nations has ever accomplished. These are strong words, but remember that the open working group and the consultations that led up to the SDGs, which actually were held over three years, is the largest ever open consultation ever held by the United Nations. You know, the Rio Plus 20 was in 2012. The SDGs were signed after a general assembly process of consultations over three years. So this is a robust and never ever seen before agenda. But you see the dilemma is, and, and, and this little joke that they might not even understand what they signed, is because what it means. Because if you look at the numbers, it actually means the following. It means that we have now agreed that we're going to, once and for all, secure food for 9 billion people. We're seven today, just in 30 years' time. So this is beyond the 2030, but it's a promise we've made that every human being should have good food. We're going to do this 
within a safe climate system, which should stay as far below as we ever can of the two degree limit and aiming for one and a half degrees Celsius because the SDGs have integrated the Paris Agreement. And what does all this mean? Well, it means, believe it or not, that in just four years' time, we need to peak the emissions of greenhouse gases in four years' time, which is like tomorrow, and then we're supposed to rush in a pace that is unprecedented, six to eight percent per year in reduction in emissions, to reach a fossil fuel-free world economy by 2050. 2050 is in 34 years. 34 years. And you see, that journey is much more rapid than when we entered the industrial era in the late 18th century. It's actually a revolution. It's an industrial revolution of a scale that we've never seen before. And I can assure you that it's exactly the same curve for fresh water, it's the same curve for protecting a biodiversity, it's the same curve if we're going to save the oceans, it's the same curve if we're serious about air quality, and it's the same curve if we're going to get rid of microplastics and chemicals. So we're in for a transformation. We're in for the most dramatic journey that humans has ever experienced on planet Earth. And it should have started yesterday. Have you seen a roller coaster taking off so far? No, I have certainly not. So you see, we are at this very painful juncture where on the one hand, we for the first time have a roadmap for a desired future for humanity on planet Earth. But on the other hand, we're not seeing the action happen yet. And this is where my testimony to you comes in. And, and this is a, you know, a quite painful testimony to make, to be honest, which is that you may be so aware that the way we normally plan the future is based on experience in the past. That's why uh, professors like myself have a kind of a raison d'etre, you know? We have long experience, we know what's happened in the past, so that is what we use as a basis for our thinking in the future. So we look at what happened 10 years back, 20 years back, 30 years back, even 100 years back, to think through how fast can we, for example, decarbonize energy systems, how fast can we embark on completely new transport systems, how fast can we start truly transforming agriculture so we stop destroying biodiversity and losing fresh water, and we kind of build that basically on linear projections on what we have seen over the past years and decades. And you rely on uh, senior people like myself and others. My little confidential message to you is, I think that will not work. I think we've come to a dead end on relying on history. I think now we have so much evidence that humanity has reached such a critical point. In fact, we are at a crisis juncture, which is so serious. I mean, just remember again, the only chance for us to stay under two degrees Celsius is to have a fossil fuel free world economy in 34 years. You know, it's such a dramatic journey that we don't even know how to do it. But it is a necessity because if we fail, then we enter the domain of irreversible, abrupt, catastrophic change. I mean, just as a reminder, the last time we were at 2 degrees Celsius is 130,000 years back, and then we had over 6 meters sea level rise. We would, dear friends, sit in water right in the Lerner Hall. So it's a very, very special situation. And my conclusion is, which is the message I'm so keen on sharing with you, is that because I don't think we can rely on history anymore, because I think that car industry and food industry and technology industry is still operating on projections into the future, which is one reason why we're moving so slowly. And I think we need completely new, creative, disruptive, crazy, big ideas, because now is the time to jump in the deep end in the pool and try never ever before tested ideas to be so brave and so courageous that the word but does not exist anymore. 
you know, we seniors are very good at saying, well, but, you know, we've tested that before. But, you know, it will be too expensive. But, you know, in the end, we cannot scale it. But, you know, it takes too long time. That's not on the table anymore. And who can provide the creative, dynamic, crazy, ambitious, optimistic, grand ideas for the future? You. I'm convinced today that it's the youth and the young generation that should be allowed to be given space to come up with the grand thinking. I mean, just to take one example, do you know how many years uh, we have politically and scientifically been fighting over a price on carbon? Have we got a global price on carbon? Oh no, not only don't we have a price on carbon, everyone agrees that we need it, but it's impossible. It's just unthinkable because we have such a complex bureaucracy, we have so many institutions, there's so many vested interests, we have nations. How would you redistribute the money? Governments cannot do it. You know, it just gets killed by the myriad of impossibilities related to senior thinkers and doers in our societies. But the truth is, between us and this hall, we need a global price on carbon, and we need it now. Because if we had had a global price on carbon of at least 50 euros per ton of carbon dioxide, I can assure you that every economist, every model shows it would give us enough incentive to once and for all put fossil fuels aside and invest in new technologies. Why don't we do it? Well, it's because we get locked in our very sophisticated thinking and our linear projections because, and that leads us to the conclusion that things are impossible. So I'm just signaling to you, it's, it's really not to put the responsibility on your shoulders. The responsibilities are here, not, not with you. But it's just to say that you should feel empowered. You should feel that you are at center stage. It's not only your planet we're talking about. Because remember that 2050, you know, I may not be around. Well, I hope I'm around actually, but you will certainly be around. So, I mean, it's not only that it's kind of your future, it's also that I think that you should now feel that we do not have the answers. You should not look up at the seniority in societies and simply say, oh, I'll, I'll lean back and trust that they will solve this for us. Oh no, unfortunately that's not the case because we're in for a revolution. And in revolutions, things are very turbulent. And in turbulence, you need creativity. And creativity resides primarily with youth, not with seniority, okay? So that's kind of message one. And then message two is, you know, if that is not incentive enough for you, let's pump in some adrenaline. Because it is so that you have reason to be angry. You have reason to be very disappointed. Because, you know, we have reached a juncture, which is not only that we're posing to the next generation catastrophic, irreversible risks, if we continue as we do, I mean, I mean continue as we do just the next 10 years. But there's another reason for double frustration, which is that today we've reached a point where the solutions are available. It's not utopia any longer. It's not science fiction. It's not even sacrifice. In fact, think of it. The sustainable, decarbonized future is the high-tech, desired frontier of the most healthy, the most attractive, the most digitally advanced. It's a Tesla future we're talking about. And still, we elders are selling to you that we love coal mines. Who loves a coal mine? You see? So this is another reason to be quite frustrated at, at the situation we're in. And we are here because we again are so stuck in our old vested interests and we're so stuck in our incremental thinking. And of course, and to close, it's not to load, you know, the kind of agenda of creativity and solutions on your shoulders. I would argue that what we are having in front of us just over the next 10 years is an agenda where youth and experience should work together. I think we should hold hands and really have each other around the table as equals and truly, you know, open up our hearts, have free open white sheets of paper and really start experimenting with really grand ideas. 
and nothing is today too crazy because we're in for such a dramatic ride. But the beauty is, it's a very promising ride. It's a ride that promises a healthier, a more attractive, a more advanced future for humanity on planet Earth. And the SDGs is the best we have. It is a roadmap, and it's a roadmap to a good future. So I really hope that we can hold hands together. And that's why you're so important. So thank you for having this opportunity of sharing this with you, and uh, good luck in the brilliant future for us all on planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you.